Sometimes they're isolated, uh, or sometimes isolated, and we're also guilt-ridden that we did something to cause the illness, or we can be shame-based. I shouldn't have been a mom. I shouldn't have been a dad. I'm, my parenting caused the illness, which is not true at all. Our relatives develop brain biology issues caused by genetics, sh shift in the genetic code, uh, you know, uh, epigenetic uh, shifts in our genetic processing as, as it comes down through the generations, and by street drugs. Street drugs today are just lethal. They are so strong. I would say half of the members of NAMI Westside Los Angeles sent their kids away to fine colleges. They smoked dope, they did marijuana, and they came home with schizophrenia. Because when you have a vulnerable brain, your brain with, with the strength of marijuana today can click over into psychosis. Psychosis is having visions or thoughts or experiences uh, shared by no one else. Only you see what you're talking about. Only you smell what you're smelling. Only you. Uh, it's an, it's a, no, no one else shares the experience, the vision, or the um, experience that you're having. So that's really what psychosis means. And, and NAMI is an organization to give those families where mental illness strikes a sense of belonging, a sense of being part of a community, which is the best shame reducer and guilt reducer we know to be part of a community. There's not one parent in this group tonight or a sibling that caused the mental illness of their relative. Yes, mental illness, brain biology diseases are not caused by um, relationships. They are not. So I, I welcome you to a NAMI meeting. I want you to, to, to go on our website and encourage you to take the free NAMI eight-week class. You will be empowered from taking this class. You will know much more and you'll be a, a better relative to your ill relative. And I, we also have uh, uh, four support groups every month for families. We have many, many peer support groups. Elizabeth, how many do we have in a month? Peer support groups. We have uh, four weekly support groups. Three mm -hmm. weekly. Well, that's a lot. So we have 12 every month. And then uh, we're, we're having a peer-to-peer -peer class right now, aren't we? Yeah. We are actually starting our peer class on March 10th. So if anyone's interested in registering, I will put my contact. Yeah, yeah, this is for individuals who have a diagnosis, who are struggling with brain issues. So without further ado, I want to introduce our almost famous illustrious speaker tonight, her name is Melody Anderson. She is a licensed clinical social worker who's been treating illness and addiction for over 26 years. She was, she created the director of the intensive outpatient family programs at Hazleton, New York, which is one of the best addiction treatment places in our nation, Hazleton. She graduated from the Ackerman Family Institute in New York and is certified in several trauma treatment modalities pretty much every one, EMDR, brain spotting, somatic therapy, and neuroaffective touch. So Ms. Anderson treats individuals, couples, and families facing addiction, depression, anxiety, mental illness, relationship conflict, grief and loss, spiritual emptiness, which probably happened to a lot of people during this last three-year pandemic, career change and life transition. She's appeared on many national media outlets, so we're very grateful you are appearing tonight for NAMI West Side Los Angeles. The title of her talk tonight is The Double-Edged Sword, Loving the Dually Diagnosed by Melody Anderson. So Melody, I'm going to turn uh, the lecture over to you and you can introduce the content of your lecture or just begin to share your, your talk? Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much um, uh, for letting me come here, Sharon. You've always been very supportive. And yeah, I've dedicated my uh, most of my life to being there for families and people who are dealing with addictions, trauma, and especially the family. Um, it's 
and, I, and you said it so perfectly, you know, the shame that's carried. So you, so you keep it inside and you feel like you're the only one. And we know through most of supportive programs, we 12 steps or through NAMI, that people heal through being with other people. The shame starts to drop when you know that you're not alone. And the inner strength comes from hearing the stories and the strategies that other families do. So I'm going to start with my PowerPoint. I'm a little bit of a, of a tech nerd. So I'm going to see, <laughs> I think I've already screwed up. I ask for your patience as I do this. Um, okay, so I've got, oh, oopsie. So I got that up. Okay, now I'm gonna do from beginning. Does anybody see me or am I just? You need, to, you need to click on the little green arrow that says share my screen, the bottom of your Oh, screen. for gosh sakes. Yes. Thank you very, very much. I only practiced this 15,000 times yesterday with Aaron and thank you as well. So let's go into screen. I'm screen sharing. We see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Now we're going to come up with this PowerPoint. All right. So initially I call it double-edged sword because, you know, you've got mental illness on one side and you've got uh, substance abuse. Uh, disorders on the other side and the family's kind of right in the middle, right on the blade and they feel the cuts. And I thought I would just come up with something a little more hopeful, which is effective strategies to help those who love the co-occurring disordered. We used to call it co-occurring disorders um, diagnosis, but we have uh, managed to in include other, other pieces as well that families have to deal with. For example, if there's a mental retardation, autism, eating disorders, um, certainly personality disorders, people who are incapable of having any kind of sense of insight or the capacity to see their part in anything. So, and also if you have questions, write them down. And I wanna make sure we have lots and lots of time to, um, to uh, so I can talk to you and share things that I might've forgotten. This comes from The Courage to Change, which is a wonderful daily reading book uh, from Al-Anon. And Al-Anon was created by the wife, Lois, of the guy who started AA. They started AA in 1939, but she didn't get it going with her girlfriends until 1953. And what they did is they took the same 12 steps, but instead of being powerless over the, the alcohol, they, were, they realized they were powerless over changing the person they loved who was drinking. And I love this because really what I, I wanna guide families through is the importance of your self-care because we can't help anybody if we're exhausted, broken, full of anger, fatigue, and hopeless. So I, I, I want to start it off with this reading from The Courage to Change, Alan, on February 25th. Alcoholism, think of that as your co-occurring disorder in a family, tends to promote neglect of self. Consequently, I never learned how to take care of myself when I didn't feel well. Even with a high fever, I went about my business just as I would any other day. Anything else seems self-indulgent and weak. In Al-Anon, I've had a chance to discover a new way to take care of myself. I'm learning to accept that I can't always feel on top of the world. I'm letting go of my unrealistic expectations. I'm not a robot. I will learn what I can do to make myself feel better. It is crucial to be diligent about taking care of ourselves, especially during stressful periods. And, um, you know, it's... It, it, if you have a problem with Al-Anon, uh, sometimes people have problems with the spiritual piece, but it's another fellowship of like-minded people who will not judge you. And Al-Anon certainly focuses on alcohol, but these days, especially with kids, they are poly drug users and also um, compulsive behaviors like computers and as they say, eating disorders, um, spending, and the support you can get from them as well as Families Anonymous. You know, if you don't have any besides NAMI, just to add to your toolbox, because often we just have one toolbox, which is to say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to just figure this out on my own because if I really am the competent, loving, terrific parent I wanna be, I should be able to solve this. And I always say to families, you know, if your child broke their leg in a bicycle accident, you wouldn't try to fix a bone because you're not trained as a doctor you take them to emergency room 
And this is what I really, you know, if there's any shift tonight that comes away is that this is not your job to fix. And of course they talk about the three C's in Al-Anon, you didn't cause it. You um, didn't, um, oh, I think I forgot. You didn't create it, you didn't cause it and you can't cure it and you can't control it, that's it. And with that understanding and almost a surrender to the reality that you can't fix the broken bone and set it for a child as well, unless you're a doctor, it starts, I hope this sort of starts to list some of the shame of what you think your responsibilities are in caring for the, um, the, your loved one who's got the co-occurring disorder. So I just want to kind of go over a little bit of the, the, what we're going to talk about tonight, which is what is dual diagnosis and or co-occurring disorders. As I say, it's a compulsive behavior or use of substances uh, as well, coupled with mental illness. And um, how do I know I need help and where to go? Well, guess what? I've got a little chart for you. And it's all, all of this is also in the, um, in, in the resources that you can get on to from namila.org. So have you ever had a fear? It's called the face chart. And see how many of these things you relate to. Have you ever had fear that you're... COD, which is what I'm calling the co-occurring disorder, dangerously mixes alcohol, I'm so sorry, dangerously mixes alcohol with their prescribed medication. A, are you angry at a COD loved one because they could not stop their using no matter how much you yelled, cried, punished, withdrew, or cut off? C, can you, you can't concentrate on work, family, and self-care because you keep cleaning up the mess from your COD. E, have you ever wanted to escape from being responsible for your COD? And D, can you accept you did not cause, can't control, and, or cure your COD loved one? Mm -hmm. So this is to me a question I always ask families when they come in. You know, when they say we're trying, we want to be good parents, you know, we want to have the respect of our community that we're good parents. So I ask these two questions, is what you've been doing been getting you what you want? And the quest, and the answer is usually no. And I say, well, let's just try something new. And as Albert Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think there's a better way to do this, but I'm gonna, okay, the need for family treatment. Here's just some statistics to let you know the, the, the degree and intensity of how COD is throughout um, throughout the population. And I, I remember I called when I was getting this lecture together, I called someone at uh, uh, AA to get some statistics from them. And when I told the woman I was talking about the duly diagnosed or co-occurring disorders, she said, everybody who drinks is mentally ill. And really she is right. Because to do something that's against our own survival is um, against uh, uh, our very uh, primal uh, energy and force to keep ourselves surviving. So the need for family treatment, uh, according to SAMHSA 2018, 9.5 Americans are diagnosed with dual diagnosis of co-occurring disorder. And sometime, million. yes? Million, 9.5 million. Million, yeah. It's, it's, and I, it's out oh, to me, that's 2018. I think it's underreported, Sharon. I really do. And um, either condition can create the other. For example, people, as Sharon was talking about, could be using, um, um, and we notice this in, in the younger kids when they're using marijuana, can change the brain and, and make it start to look like a schizophrenic brain. Um, Sometimes someone who is very depressed will start, start taking a substance and be addicted to it because it's the only thing that gives them some form of relief. Because remember, when we look at addiction, addiction is really about trying to find something for escape that can relieve an inner pain or someone who actually has chronic pain so they don't have to suffer, which is, you know, if you want to start building up some compassion for your family member, which I think is the essence of knowing how to handle this, is they're not doing it to be bad. They're not doing it to hurt you. They're doing it to give themselves relief. And it's the only tool that they have. And when they get into recovery, the nice thing is, is that they start to learn other tools and other ways and have a community just like you guys are in to talk to others because who knows better 
than someone who's gone through this. I'd like to say I've had a perfect life and no troubles, but my father had a drinking issue and my mother had some personality disorders and depression. So um, I do, I have benefited both by Al-Anon and from Alcoholics Anonymous. 50 to 65% of those in treatment centers have a mental health disorder and 41 to 66% of those with a substance abuse disorder have mental illness. So it's pretty well, you know, 50-50, like the girl at, at AA said. Most of the duly diagnosed use alcohol, followed by marijuana. 7% of alcohol abusers and 53% of drug abusers have at least one serious mental illness. And that can include everything from anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, one or two. One is it seems to happen younger um, and has more mania. Bipolar two has more depression and usually happens later in life. The COD have a higher risk for violence, suicidal ideation and completion, property damage and physical illness than if they only had one of the disorders present. So if you're scared, they're scared. 7% of schizophrenics are four times more likely than the regular population to have substance use disorder. And 67% of borderlines have substance use disorder and 23 to 40% of the depressed and anxious have SUD. If you don't know what a borderline is, it is someone who is incapable of seeing their part in things and having insight and look to others to rescue them and then try to push them away if they get too close. So as I roll down the shop here, um, okay, 61% of bipolar ones have substance abuse disorder five times more than the general public. Wow, and 84% of those with antisocial behavior have a, social, uh, a substance abuse disorder. And for every one person, now here's where we get, where we get to the families. For every one person, with a co-occurring disorder, 10 others are affected. Okay, this is pretty overwhelming, but now for the good news. COD is treatable. It is a very, um, it involves an integrated report, uh, 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 interventions, including medical, judicial, educational, uh, therapeutic, some, some treatment centers, some uh, living centers. And it all has to work together with the family because we know in the stats that treating families with a COD loved one increases, listen to this hope, increases the percentage of your loved one's chance of maintaining sobriety, regularly attending outpatient treatment centers, adhering to medical protocol, and having longer periods of emotional stability. Uh, well, that's, that's the kind of product that I wanna buy if that's what's gonna happen. So one of the things I, I want to start off with, um, well, no, I'm going to start off with something else, um, is the power of knowledge. And the more you know about the type of mental illness, the more you research the type of um, substance somebody is on and its effects and what withdrawal looks like, the more you're going to have a, an idea of what you've got. I have two, two cases here. I had a, a lovely young woman who had been on benzos, Valium and Clonopin, Ativan. She became extremely angry and dizzy and depressed. And this was only after being on the benzo for four months. She was not able to function and she, just, and she was staying with her family until she felt better because now she was off the benzo. Naturally, they became frustrated with her behavior and were fearful she was getting emotionally sick again. Frustrated by her condition and her parents' distress, my client discovered, very bright people, my, my client discovered her parent, uh, um, a publication called the Ashton Manual and it talks about withdrawal sim symptoms in it. It presented the side effects um, from benzo uh, withdrawal. She shared this information with her parents. They found relief because again, it wasn't their failure. And I think that's something Sharon really, really emphasizes. The other one is I had a client who um, had a paradoxical or shall I say opposite response to uh, a drug they were given. He was on narcotics. He was usually leaves someone like this. And in fact, it, it energized him. And he didn't know how to have energy in life without taking narcotics. 
well, there were tools and we worked on it and, and it got taken care of. But the knowledge of, of conditions and seeing what people look like when they're on and off the medications and the substances is really important. So one of the beautiful things, I have so much passion in this, in this career I'm in, is that we keep moving along not to say that talk therapy and witnessing somebody's story is an extremely important uh, aspect of therapy. But we're finding that with certain skills that when someone is anxious, um, depressed, maybe responding from a trauma, the activation in the body can either have them disassociate or um, you're standing around watching and you're getting overwhelmed and nervous by what you're seeing. So there's a brilliant guy called Peter Levine. And I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, probably. He started to really study how the brain worked and the emotional part on the right side of the brain and the more thinking, I'm making this very simplistic, the more thinking, judgmental, um, assessment, logic, pro solution solving here. And when people on the brain scans, when people are emotional in anger, fear, whatever's going on, this area lights up on the brain scan. And the area that's supposed to solve our problems is actually black. So he started and is totally offline. So what he did was he started to come up with these skills and exercises that would cool down this emotional part of the brain so the thinking part could engage. And how does he do it? Well, when I'm anxious, a very primitive part in the back of my, my brain connects with my body and it tells me to put out my fight, flight and freeze hormones. That's adrenals and cortisols. And when they go, I can run faster and my, my blood vessels tighten so the saber tooth tiger won't get me. But we don't have saber tooth tigers anymore. Most of them are all in our heads. So what these somatic skills do is through specific, I'm gonna ask you to join me. And if you don't want to, that's fine. Or press your off camera button, but I'll go ahead and do it with you. What they do within 15 to 20 seconds, they lower the adrenals and the cortisol. They slow down the heartbeat. They lower the, the hormones. And a person starts to engage now on what is really going on. This keeps it from making um, impulsive, dangerous um, reactions instead of a response that comes from some thought. So I'm gonna do three of these with you. There's a heck of a lot more on the um, resource page, which you can get. And if you have any questions, please ask me afterwards. So the very first one I do when I'm working with people for the first time is the heart sandwich. And you just take your one or two hands, ideally two, and place them over your mid chest. And as you do that, notice the weight on your chest. Notice if there's any warmth. And notice if there's any sensation shift in your body. I know I feel my heartbeat. I feel it slowing down. My chest is kind of opening up. The other thing, and this is really powerful. And remember, you can teach all these things to your, to your loved ones so they can self-regulate instead of using a substance. This little puppy here, uh, I think this one comes from Target, but there's also, you give them at CVS, they're not that expensive. They have different weights. Weighting the body with a blanket or putting a weight on your feet creates grounding. And when a person feels a weight on their feet, what happens is their focus goes from whatever anxiety or fearful thought they have to the weight that's on the feet. So again, they come into the here and now instead of worrying about the past or being fearful about the future. And my favorite is the 745 breath. I use this a lot driving around in, in Los Angeles because the traffic's so horrible. And so I have one hand on the wheel and one hand on my chest and first, we breathe out instead of like yoga where you breathe in through your nose first and then blow out. We blow out because we want the carbon dioxide out of our lungs so we have even more room to put in the oxygen. So you just breathe out through your mouth for seven. Very gently breathe in through your nose for a count of four, keep your shoulders down. Stop and hold for a count of five as the oxygen goes throughout our body and breathe out again. 
for seven. And often people notice some calming or opening up or relaxing of the chest area. Now, Peter Levine has another piece that is just spectacular with this breath out, is he has the word voo. And when you're doing this in the breath out, what happens is there's some, some vibration you'll feel in your body from the sound. And that also starts, again, we want to slow down the heartbeat. We want to bring down those hormones. This is for ourselves. And also, as they say, can be so helpful to our family members. So if you want to join me in it, you can do breathe out for seven. <laughs> Gently in for a count of four. Stop. Hold. <laughs> And you can see, feel the vibration in your mouth and your chest. And sometimes he uses the voo with a, a jaw movement because we get so tense here. And um, if you want to make fun of me and laugh, that's okay. But it works and it works fast. And as a therapist, especially when we're overwhelmed, I want my clients and I want my families to find a centering so they can feel they're taking care of themselves and get back online. So I'm gonna talk about some communication constants. And also, by the way, before I go on, speaking of self-care, best thing for your eyes on computers with all this zooming that goes on, blink your eyes often because our eyes dry out, have your water available because we dehydrate. And every 20 minutes, look up for 20 seconds at something 20, 20 feet, about 20 feet away, and then come back to your screen. This eases eye stress. Because my again, my concern is that you have ways to, to care for yourself. So communication constants. I love this. Uh, and this comes out of um, actually Alcoholics Anonymous. When you feel like saying something to your partners, uh, your children, whether or not they're the COD or family or people at work, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? And does it need to be said by me now? And what that allows is maybe a call to somebody um, or writing something of what you want to say before you say it. So we don't have to make apologies or hurt someone else because of our own fear or tension or anger. And then, of course, I love the acronym WAIT. Why am I talking? Well, I know I'm talking because I'm going to continue to give you some more communication skills to give you some, some more guidance. So when I studied at Ackerman, they always had this thing that the family that eats together stays together. Because what happens in that table is that exchange between family members. One of the things I highly recommend for families is that everyone goes around and says one gratitude about either their day or and then about one member at the table. It's a very powerful bonding thing. And I guess in a, in a way, I, that's what the what praying around the table also does, but it connects the family and it's that eye to eye contact with all these cells and all this nonsense kids are not getting that eye to eye contact anymore. And it's not creating the capacity to mirror other people's emotions and develop empathy in their brain. So this eye to eye contact is essential and you can do that around the dinner table, or breakfast table, whatever you can do. Um, the other sad thing that happens in a family is that um, sometimes the other siblings take a back seat to the drama and chaos. And they do need to be heard and they do need to be checked in with. Sometimes siblings and grandparents de develop what we call codependent and enabling behaviors, which basically instead of letting somebody feel the consequence of their behavior, they cover up the mess or keep the seat, hold the secret. And often siblings, once the COD does start to improve, the other siblings now have the opportunity to act out, which they should have been able to do maybe years before, but couldn't. And of course the couple, relationship suffers you know that that you know if you want to blame somebody blame your partner I love that feeling I love doing it but it doesn't get me anywhere so what I do is the couple unites in fact the whole family unites but especially for the couple that you unite against the the um, COD but you also give security especially if we're talking about younger children you give security to the kids to know that you're a unit because their whole goal and especially with personality disorders is to divide you get you fighting so you're not on their case and instead of saying things like you better what were you thinking 
come from compassion and sometimes compassion is really hard. So that's why I say the education is so important. Come from understanding that this is not something that someone's doing because they want no want to, I mean, nobody wakes up and says, I want to be an addict and, and be severely depressed or have schizophrenia. I'm concerned for you. You may not feel like it, but we love you. Or we have to do many things you may not like, but it's our job to keep you safe and alive. And ask others to tell you what they just heard. You know, we have our own histories of traumas and past experiences we bring into our relationship with the, the COD. And so often we don't hear them or they don't hear what we're saying because we're talking to different parts of ourselves from the past or the present, the strong self, the frightened self, the young self, the older self. We have all these different parts in us. So it's very essential that when you're telling somebody, and don't say too many sentences, that when you're talking to somebody, have them repeat it back to you so that they really hear the meaning. Like, for example, you know, you really should be getting out of bed. Well, I think you're calling me a loser and all that. No, no, I'm just concerned that I want you to have a day and take care of yourself and get cleaned up. Um, and of course, no cell phones. I think the most evil thing around a table that can be invented, unless you're a fireman or a policeman. Um, so I'm um, just checking my time here. And now I'm gonna go on to some cognitive skills. And cognitive skills basically mean how I perceive myself in the world as a result of my perceptions that are misperceptions that could have come up from traumas, how I was raised, my future fears. And we see the world through a distorted lens. So what cognitive skills work on is working on what we're thinking and perceiving of ourselves, whether it's the truth or not. I mean, I, uh, for whatever reason, you know, uh, I grew up with a dad who gambled. So we had money. We didn't have money. I still have this ongoing fear of being a bag lady. Okay. But the fact is, is it a reality? I have a, a savings plan and a pension and all this sort of stuff. It's not a reality. But what I do in my cognitive work is I question the truth of those events in the now. And what I've got there is an abbreviation of a thing for brain spotting, somatic experience, and EMDR therapy work on a lot of trauma. The one I found the most effective is brain spotting. And it involves finding a spot that's a resource spot. And you can actually do this at, uh, uh, at home by just looking at a spot on your wall, find one that's calming and then stick with that, especially when you're overwhelmed. And then without the person having to say much, their eyes are connecting with the limbic system and it goes down the central nervous system to release places. Like when we're in fear, we brace or, or afraid, we brace. And it gets contained into the nervous system and in the body. It's fast. I have miracles in one to two sessions. And it relieves people of a lot of anxiety. Rational motive therapy talks about creating a pause between the first thought and immediate action. Is this belief true? What evidence do I have of it? I have no evidence I'm going to be a bag lady. What would I be? I love this question. What would I be and what would I be doing if I didn't have this perception? If I wasn't worried about being a bag lady, I probably could go out and maybe make some money. And then the, the final, and a lot of the 12 steps do have a lot of Buddhism in it, like, you know, doing service for others um, and staying in the now, focusing on what we need to do in this moment, having gratitude about what we have. Sometimes it's just, I have five, no, I have 10 fingers and 10 toes. Uh, acceptance of what we have in the moment. They talk about this in, in AA and in the acceptance prayer. We accept things for the way they're supposed to be in this moment. I may not be able to ac accept it this, later this evening, but in this moment, I can being non-judgmental, practicing non-attachment to events, people. I think I meant to say ideas and concepts. So I love this line. How is my now? When you find yourself dysregulated, you feel that tightening in your chest, your throat, your head, ask yourself, how is my now? And right now, my now is great. I'm here. I hope I'm helping people. I love talking about this. I have uh, indoor plumbing, uh, you know, and clean sheets. And, you know, my now is really, really good. So let's see what's next. 
Oh, why boundaries? This is one of my favorite sayings. Why do we need to set boundaries? Because people change not because they see the light, but because they feel the heat. A.L. Holmcroft. I, and, and when we set boundaries, but they have to be connected to a consequence, otherwise they're not effective. And you have to be prepared that you're setting a boundary you can do, because if the, the COD knows that you're not going to stand by your boundary, all hell breaks loose. So let's look at some boundaries here. First of all, we can't send about, set a boundary without a consequence. However, without some respect and regard of the shame your COD carries, which is pretty intense, they may fight, placate, or just ignore you. They may just leave the room. So boundaries and consequences to be effective require a mutual agreement with caregivers and the COD. And to ensure everyone is really ready to hear and listen, have a third party present, especially uh, if you can do it in a, in a family therapy session or with other families. And no halt. What does that mean? That comes from AA. It means don't be hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And I've added another H to that, which is don't be high, don't be hungry or dehydrated, which is why I'm going to do this right now if anybody wants to join me. Take your 20 seconds and look at something on the wall. And to me, the this, I just love this woman. She's so brilliant. Jane Bluestein is an educator, PhD educator. And she writes about setting, has tons of books about writing, set, uh, setting boundaries with your teens. Now, most addicts are about the emotional age of development of an adolescent. Because as life, think about an arc, as life starts to get intense and horrible, instead of learning the lesson that they can have to grow up or be responsible and get to the other side, they get up here, they use a substance and they never really have to um, learn how to grow up. So even if they're in their 40s or 50s, sometimes addicts behave like they're teenagers. So, um, and I came up with this Anderson arc, arc of recovery that kind of explains that. So what we want to do is like bricks, we want to build up the consequences enough so that someone, and not falsely, but the, the boundaries and consequences enough so when somebody gets to a point where it's, it, they become, they hit their bottom. That's about the only way that can happen. And we can help them as families, but with love. Uh, and again, Al-Anon is so powerful for that. So one of the things she recommends is, I love this with teens, is you offer them a choice. You can say, well, you can either come home tonight at nine uh, and uh, then you get to do blah, blah, or you can come home whenever you want and you'll be grounded for two weeks. Take your choice. Um, she recommends offering the choices that you know you've already want. So the teen thinks they have the power in the room and this will help them to follow it better. And they feel like they're part of the decision. It gives them a certain level of dignity. And um, I believe in writing contracts and everybody's signing them. So put it on the fridge with a magnet in case some one of them comes up with, you know, I never said that. Look at your signature. Um, and this is very powerful because let's talk about relapse. It's such an important piece and is so common with CODs. Expectations are built in resentments. And because of the high rate of relapse with the duly diagnosed, especially when they're not taking their prescribed medic, uh, medications, um, we need to be prepared. You may need to make that 911 call that can save their or your life. Tell 911 that you want to do a 5150. That's the code for suicide. And so they'll send over the EMT and the police may come, but they won't, they'll take them to a hospital and not to a jail. Because if they're in a situation of, of, of aggressiveness and delusions, to put them in a jail is not going to help them. And the 5150 means they're in there for usually about seven to two hours of observation to see if it's drug related or they're actually in a psychotic condition that, we're, that would let the docs know they can use another kind of medication. And always develop an escape plan. Keep your keys, cell and wallet close in case the COD becomes violent, because that is a reality. So what are we, what are we looking for when there's relapse signs? Obviously sleeping or eating too much or too little, isolating, staying in the bedroom or the bathroom too long, 
mental confusion, sometimes slurring, unsteady on their feet, missing their therapy or medical appointments. And if narcotics are involved, there's a lot of sweating uh, that's involved with the, um, um, with the withdrawal. And there's a very ashen color to the skin. And often there's, there's problems of constipation if they're using it, or they're wearing long sleeves on a hot day with, to cover up any track marks they might have on their arms. There's grades that are dropping. Lack of hygiene is always a, a good cue. And, hang, and they see them start hanging out with their old using friends in their old using places. All right. So um, how do we discuss relapse? As I said, it's very common. We talked about the 911. And when you're talking to your loved one, discuss the relapse as a learning point versus the failure. What have we learned a lot about this as a family? How can we support you so it doesn't happen? How can you support us? Because part of this exchange of power, uh, which the user really does want to have some sense of dignity and power in the family is saying, so tell us what we can do to be of help. Well, you never let me do what I want to do. Well, as Jane Bluestein would say, well, yeah, that may upset you, but since we're still the parents um, and economically involved in your lives, we do have to take certain stands. If you don't like it, then these are gonna be the consequences. We don't know if you can stay here, but this is, this is after you've gone to family therapy and you've worked out consequences with a therapist and what you can and can't handle. Do not bluff. You will lose the war if you bluff. Um, and then I talked about doing the relapse uh, um, contract. Um, you offer your consequences, not punishment, engage in renegotiating your and their behaviors and um, possibilities of future inpatient treatment if things get worse. And if the worst happens, and I mean so many people I've worked with have lost their children. Um, this is where it, it's essential to have the, the spiritual support of others experience and kindness around you is get to a grief group, go to Al-Anon, go to NAMI, go to those people who have gone through this because the only way we get through life is with help and certainly not on our own. And I think this is the end of it. So I'm gonna look forward to your questions. I wanna thank all of you for joining me tonight. I hope you found something that was helpful. And I told you about for resources and a replay of this, you'll go to NAMI. Also, I don't have in the resources a place called Demore Health in Huntington Beach, which actually treats the CODs, that's their number. And there's this really wonderful woman called Becky Henry. She has a hope network for families um, that, are, that have, love someone who's got an eating disorder. It's a wonderful group. She has online groups, all this. That's my name and number and email if you'd like to get in touch with me. Oh, did I not put my, oh, you know what? I'm gonna just put my, well, I'll tell you what it is. My, um, my website, if you wanna see it, is www.counselingbymelody.com. And I've got a lot of information about what I offer, my trainings and all that stuff. So that's counselingbymelody.com. And I wanna thank Sharon and Aaron for tech training and everyone for listening and let's hear what you've got to say yes yeah, so if we can not share the screen so i can see everybody and if you would like to ask a question if you could raise your hand or there's a reaction down there at the bottom of the screen uh, you can put a hand up in your screen and i will call on you to ask melody a question if i see your actual hand up or if i see the the reaction. I see somebody's hand up, and is I, I don't know your name. Is that Nazi? Uh, hi. No, it's a woman. You, I can't see your name, but please, yeah. I can't, can't see your name. What What is your name? I think it's hi. Anne. I'm Anne. I'm Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. Anne. Hi, Anne. Uh, hi. I'm sorry. I'm Anne, and I'm a very, very grateful member of Al-Anon. 18 years. I am also on the board of NAMI Urban LA. Oh, wonderful. I oh, want to Anne, thank that's you. I didn't <laughs> yes. recognize you. Now Melody, I, I want to thank you for such a wonderful, comprehensive discussion mm -hmm. of, of COD. Um, I too have a loved one, and it's been a struggle for the past 20 years. My loved one is now in what I call a good place, recovery in terms of substance 
and also and working with the sponsor and attending her meetings regularly mm. and also regularly seeing her psychiatrist and yeah. psychologist and taking her medication and just gravitating toward anything about the brain. But let me tell you something, this has been a journey. And if I had not had Nami and Elena, and yeah, I say yeah. the two, yeah. I really, I really wouldn't be at this point. Well, I am maybe, so maybe, appreciative. Maybe, maybe you could I just, share some of the magic things that you have learned and did with your daughter that brought her to this place. Um, well, you talked about the three C's, didn't cause it, can't control it, can't cure it. I've got that. Uh, never operating from halt, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Yeah. Um, wait, why am I talking? <laughs> learning, <laughs> learning some of those things and actually working the 12 steps and working with the sponsor and attending meetings. I want to make a quick plug for our meetings. We have meetings all over Southern California and we're one of the very fortunate states to have a lot of meetings on the West side. And well, now through Zoom, we have just everything. We have parent focused meetings. We have men's meetings. We have women's meetings. Uh, a lot of the parent focus meetings are predominantly women, but still there's a black belt meeting originating, originating from La Cunada on Saturdays, 160 people strong on Zoom from all over the world. Um, I just can't say enough about understanding what is going on with co-occurring disorders, mm. understanding what is going on with the brain. And that is where I'm continuing to read on a daily basis, more about the brain, more about medications. My loved one does not live with me. And that has been something that we've had to work on, but she's in an environment where um, she's with other women who are struggling. Let's put it that mm. way. But she's we have conversations about the brain. We have conversations about how she's feeling, but this has taken a lot of work. A lot of time, yeah. And I have to say that it continues. This journey is not a sprint, it's a marathon. I'll be doing this for as long as I live. And as mm -hmm. I told my sponsor today, I'll probably be doing it when I'm no longer here from the grave because my heart is always gonna be with her. I'll mention something quickly that I use a lot when I share in meetings. When I first came in, when her, with her first of multiple treatment centers, I was very, very angry. I didn't know where all of this came from. But over time, I became frustrated because why can't she take her meds? Why can't she be clean? Why can't she? Why can't she? In time, I realized that this is something that she really had no true control over and the compassion just began to seep in. And now I have nothing but compassion for her. I mean, the, yeah, that's, the that's, anger that's has long beautiful. gone. Yeah, because so, I, because what I find out of the understanding comes some compassion, and out of the compassion comes forgiveness. It is a yes, process to yes. get there. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming. Thank you, Sharon. So nice to see you. So you nice too, to Sharon. See you. Yeah, we shared <laughs> and, a lot. And also for people who want to have some fun on your twelve-step meetings. They have them around the world. You could go to Ireland, you could go to Rome, you could go to Australia, even since we can't travel. And it's really wonderful to hear other al around the world and what they're doing. Yes. Yes. So Let's go to I international al Zoom meetings and you'll get a whole list of them. Any other questions for this evening for Melody? Any other here with our audience? Yes, uh, Cheryl. And nice to see you too, Cheryl. I haven't seen you in a long time. I think you must be muted. I think you're muted. Because I can't hear a word you're saying. I'll see yes. you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to see you, Sharon. And thank you, Melody. Um, so my story uh, on, on dual diagnosis, um, Clearly, my son was using um, alcohol and marijuana to deal with his confusion and pain and um, ultimately ended his life. Oh, um, sorry. Um, so the struggle <laughs> after his first attempt and I got him home, the struggle was for me to get him off marijuana. For a long time, he had been using alcohol to dull his pain. I went for eight months to Al-Anon. I'm glad to hear your positive experience. Um, I, in a session of the um, Al-Anon that I was attending, um, mentioned 
NAMI and how important it was for me to deal with the other problem that, that it was very confusing to find dual diagnosis places, a lot of places for addiction, not much for dual. Yeah. And um, anyway, they basically said, we can't talk about other organizations, please don't. And so it was, it, that was not, a, 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 a shortly thereafter, I stopped going to al -Anon. Actually, by that time, he changed from alcohol to marijuana. So, mm -hmm. it, um, but anyway, in trying to help him, uh, we, I was trying to continually trying to explain dual diagnosis to him and, and he, he did not understand what that meant. And it, it, you know, took it as, as an assault or a criticism. And, um, well, it's very hard for someone to tell you that you've got a mental illness. I mean, it, you know, they, it's really hard for them to admit to that because of the shame that it's, it's more, almost more shame about the mental illness than there is about the addiction. But I couldn't find help basically for, for, you know, first they'd say, well, then he's got to go totally off weed or another place would say, well, no, he probably needs to continue with the weed while we try to work through some talk therapy. And, and basically, I, this is now four years ago. Um, so I'm hoping things have progressed, but the dual diagnosis and, and finding a place that can, well, that can make the judgment should they continue being allowed <laughs> allowed <laughs> to use uh, marijuana or not or uh, i mean this you know what I, I just hear your confusion and as a mother you know husbands can go, come and go or wives can come and uh, come and go but when when your child passes there's a wound forever and part of the gifts of some of these somatic skills, I really highly recommend, recommend everybody practice them, is that it stops the perseverating of thinking that you can find an answer to understand it. Why would someone do something that was self-destructive? Well, somehow in their thinking, it's giving them some form of peace or lack of pain or whatever. I just ask you to have compassion for yourself for so much that you did do. And... And, you know, certainly joining the groups, helping other families who go through this is helpful, but have some kindness and compassion for what you've gone through and how much you did do, because this is really step one. We are totally out of control of getting someone well. And, 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 I, and another feature, Cheryl, your son became so paranoid. Mm -hmm. You couldn't relate to him, you know, and you tried so hard. I remember mm -hmm. how hard you tried to relate to him and have him have him receive anything from you he eventually could receive nothing from his mother yeah and you didn't cause that and you certainly couldn't cure it and you cannot control the outcome of your son's brain disease i thank you i understand that i'm just saying that this dual diagnosis thing is a conundrum that very mm -hmm. few therapists or or specialists have have experience or they they take well we're going to take on the addiction first and then the person panics because that's their way of coping and i mean it's i just am hoping there's progress in this area well i think you bring up a very good point cheryl because a lot of treatment centers will do one or the other and they may even say they do dual diagnosis, but they don't have people who are dealing with trauma and they don't have, they're not using psychiat psychiatrists as well for appropriate medication. Um, and, you know, I, I, um, there's a, there are some dual diagnose, uh, uh, again, um, organizations you can, you can join, but check if you're looking for treatment or something, Make sure you're checking out if they're what their level of dual diagnosis is, and does it include trauma treatment? And I mean trauma treatment like brain spotting, EMDR, somatic skills. It's not just hearing someone tell their stories because we used to do that in the old days, and people were just totally uh, overreacted and, and sometimes disassociated. So, 
So my best, my best thoughts to you, Darren, and your loss and well, all how hard you've worked. It's just that I get asked and I'm glad to share, um, but I don't have been, I feel like not much has progressed in dual diagnosis and I don't know where to refer people to. Well, I've got some in, in the resources that you get off of the NAMI site. I've got some places very, and that Huntington place, give them a call too. Um, I've talked that, to did you get that number? I, I talked to them four years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. But there, there, there are some around, but really see what's in, in, in place there because they may not um, actually be doing dual diagnosis and trauma work. Yeah. The problem is um, addiction is uh, there's a more structured way to deal with addiction and mental illness yes. is so unpredictable and so uncertain. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's two steps forward, uh, two steps backward. And people say they they treat the duly, duly diagnosed, but a lot of treatment places do not really know about mental right. illness. Right. Right. Because yeah. there's more money in treating addiction from the federal government and other sources than there is in treating mental illness. So, uh, you know, because they say they treat mental illness and you have your relative there and it turns out they don't treat mental illness. Mm -hmm. So sweetheart, good luck. And I, I struggle with these things too. People call me all the time for, you know, suggestions for treatment. And I just talked to a young man running for the state assembly in um, Sacramento and and he wants to, the one thing he wants to do is develop more treatment centers for the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to get some literature from him and I'll send it out to everybody. But it's, it's, it's a profound problem in America today. We have a dearth of treatment for people with serious mental illness, not just in California, but all over the nation. And sometimes it's very hard to to identify the mental illness because so many of the withdrawal and, and the symptoms of the using looks like someone's schizophrenic if they're using crystal meth or um, severe depression if they're you know using a lot of um, alcohol or pot or something. So there's this time lag too before you can actually diagnose unless it's real schizophrenia, but even that can be generated from the substance. That's why this is so hard. So any other questions here? Anybody else have a question for uh, Melody? I do. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Mary Lou, you have your hand up. Yes, you can, you can, let's hear your question. It's a quick question. Uh, my closest friend, prayer partner, is struggling with a dual diagnosis husband that is on a, in the most intense manic episode I've seen and also drug addiction. Um, she finally had to file a restraining order against him yesterday. It, it, I didn't know about this in time to let her know about it. Is there a way she can watch tonight's program? Yes. Yes, it's, it's being recorded and it's on our website. www.namila.org. Oh, I know about our that. website, www. N-A-M-I-L-A.org. And Melody's talk will be on this website. Thank you, know, you when, so much. When, you know it'll be up, Sharon, so I can tell. I, I don't know. Aaron, maybe Aaron can answer that question. I think it takes a couple days. Or Tim, mm -hmm. you can answer that question. I don't know. We'll have it up probably by the end of the week. And what we'll, you know, in our newsletter too, what we usually do is say, in case you missed it, and we'll put the link. Um, but, but yes, it will be up in the next couple of days and it's on our YouTube as well. So the Janice Black Warner speaker series, we have all the other speakers that have presented, um, over the months and years. And so if you Google NAMI Westside LA YouTube, you'll see our YouTube channel and it will be on there as well. So our YouTube and our website and Mary Lou, if you put your, um, if your email in the chat box, I'll be sure to send you the link directly if you'd like. So just put your email in the chat box. Thank you. I'll follow up with you directly. I'll do that right now. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions tonight for Melody? Yes, Andrew. He. I think you're Janet, muted. Look, it looks you're like Janice has her hand up, Sharon. Well, after. Oh, wait. Yeah. And I. I uh, 
yes. wonder that uh, what is the hope? Like, how can we hope? My daughter uh, was diagnosed schizophrenia a, a year ago. She was a professor in USC before that, and she quit her job. And uh, now she's in treatment and she started working. And uh, it looks uh, like her, but she is not the same person right now. Yeah. And uh, I want to, I mean, if there is any statistics or any experience that what can be expected. Right now she is under care of UCLA aftercare program. Great. That they are watching her if she has symptoms or anything to take care of it. But it's it's just uh, for, for a year and then it will go away. And um, I'm, um, mm. I want to know what is the future, if you can help. Oh, I, I, my, I just, my heart goes out to you. It's such a sad story. And part of the problem with treating mental illness is everybody responds differently because it's like fingerprints. And they'll start someone in a med and they'll respond to it or they won't or they get worse or sometimes they get a little bit numb. And some of the schizophrenic medications sometimes blunt some of the um, emotional uh, responses of people, which in a way has a cruel piece to it, but it also for, to allow them to live in society, it kind of blunts some of that. If she is functioning, I mean, you've done a beautiful job of getting her help and sending her to the right place. If she's functioning and has at least one or two friends, uh, she's doing well. You know, schizophrenia comes from basically having holes in your brain and seems to be um, connected to kids who are born in like January when mothers get flus, it seems to be connected to something with the, um, the immune system. But she sounds like she's doing so much better than she was. And so, you know, that question I ask, how is your now? Think about for your now, how far along she's come and how much you've been there yeah. for her. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck there. That was a lovely response. And Tim, who else had their hand up? You mentioned somebody. Janice. I did. I did. Yeah, Janice. Yes. Okay, Janice. Okay. First, Melody, um, first, I want to just go back to what you spoke about weighted items, how it calms you down. I remember when my children were young, my girlfriend said, hug them with a pillow. And when they're like having a tantrum or they're very upset, and I remember that really worked for them about 30 years ago and I didn't even know about weighted anything but you you hug them and you hold a pillow on them and it just it gives that weight it also contains them and they feel safe it's like being back in the womb you know swaddling is always very very wonderful and uh, and, and I've got all this in the, in the um, somatic skills but one of the things I was doing with this little 10 year old today is I have a stuffed bunny that's all squishy and, or if they have loveys or whatever you want to call it, and they hold it like this close to their chest. It's when that area is guarded by something that's comforting, something warm, sometimes even just a heating pad, but the weight is the ability to squish something makes a big difference, helps to calm them. And, you know, something I didn't mention is the increasing um, co-occurring disorders with the elderly. And because um, they forget their meds, uh, um, and they respond to respond with, with less medications. And they're still in the old amounts, but giving them something to hold. You know, what, you know, one of the things with my mom while she, before she passed, is I made sure she had some cuddle toys, because there was some regression going on in dementia, and so that she could just hold it and not feel alone. Because none of us really want to be alone, and that's what some of these somatic skills will give us in these weighted things. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, such great knowledge for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And any last questions here? Yes, actually, Sharon, I'd like to ask a quick question. Um, yes, now, sure, Tim, go ahead. Um, I've actually been doing brain spotting um, over the last few months and found it incredibly helpful. And it's fast and, too, isn't it? And you don't have well, to say anything. Yeah, but about I'm the not. Trauma. Yeah, but 
Yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know that fast is how I would describe it, but I would call it deep and it's yeah. been really helpful. I um, have a loved one who lives with uh, bipolar disorder mm -hmm. and um, he also drinks occasionally as, and I, I have just taken a commitment at a weekly Al-Anon meeting. So I'm really very on Eight. board with all of that support. But I'm curious how brain spotting for you, what your experience has been brain spotting with people with, you know, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and how you were talking about having miracles, but, you know, dealing with, with mental health conditions of that nature. Yeah. Um, I have not worked with anybody with schizophrenia. I know that there's brain spotting po protocol for people with, um, with, with schizophrenia and bipolar. And if anyone would like to learn more about it, please go to brain spotting on your uh, address bar. And Dr. David Grand, like the piano, mm -hmm. is the guy who has it. And he's got little snippets, little video clips throughout the whole thing. It helps explain it. Uh, but um, make sure you're going to a certified brain spotting. Yeah. There's some, got some great ones in California. But again, like you're asking about treatment centers, ask them if they actually work with bipolar and with... Um, with uh, schizophrenics some I've, do some don't i've never thought to even ask my therapist but david grand has a playlist of music and the, so i'll listen to his music while we're doing the brain spotting it's been fantastic yeah basically what what tim's talking about is you have these headphones and it's sort of alternating sounds back and forth which also helps to to regulate and go deeper into the more um, primitive part of the brain some people like it, some people don't. We always check in to see if it works for somebody. So thanks for bringing that up, Tim. I appreciate it. Thank you for all the great this work. This has been doing. so helpful, Melody. And so if, if there are no further questions, I want to, I don't see Thank any you. further Julian questions. has his hand up. Ah! Hello. Julian. I am I'm sorry to be your, uh, your final question here. I came in about um, 10 minutes into the lecture. What a, what a wonderful... Uh, lecture i'm actually sitting here in my car in santa monica in front of shutters about to go for my walk but i, I my heart's beating fast because i haven't attended one of the the nami lectures in a long time i used to go quite regularly but i wanted to ask you about um you know in my situation my mom is 82 she's in montreal canada um i've gone to heroic efforts to save her from this whole situation that we're in with my sister who's now 60 and uh, to, to sum it up quickly my best friend here who's a top LA County social worker mainly for children she felt so bad for me that I've been terrorized trying to fix this for so long and I started going to Al-Anon as well Great. recently um, she went to Montreal in December on her own dime without me and lived in my mother's house who she has a good relationship with even my sister to assess and she had my sister on a zoom with a colleague in LA just to make sure her findings were correct and she said not only is your sister a borderline and narcissist like you thought but to, to not a major extreme but she also has thing called fictitious disorder, which I've never heard uh. of, where you invent illnesses like her colitis and to gain sympathy to hold the family hostage. And yeah, my it's mother, called, it's called point, it's called Munchausen syndrome, where you know you yeah. kept coming up um, with either someone with yourself or someone else to get attention and care. Yeah, right. So to to finish up here, my mom. <laughs> Had a, had a wonderful therapist in Montreal, like a Sharon called Mrs. Sigmund, who passed away, who was her age. I got my mom a new therapist because I knew we'd be placing my dad for Alzheimer's. And wow. I knew my sister would yell at my mom over this. So I was already, in, I mean, what I've done, you can't even imagine. But the, the point is, is that um, the gaslighting and I, I find myself, um, obviously, I want to help my mother and I have a lot of, and I, indirectly, I want to help my sister, I think, as well. But for the people on the receiving end of the behavior, it's not talked enough about, about the consequences it has on us as far as, um, you know, I'm like Pacino and De Niro. I'm trying to catch the criminal. I'm, I'm trying to fix this. It, 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 I think I'm, in a way, more obsessed about fixing this because I have tremendous fear over being stuck with this problem one day. And yes. my mom... Yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. And I'm grateful to be here. And I look well, forward to these slides. 
One of the things that, you know, I said, you know, the Einstein thing is trying to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's insanity. Is yeah. that with borderline personality, you know, extreme narcissists, is they lack insight. So they are incapable of change. And if you keep thinking, you know, if I only had one arm, if I had 17 heads, that would, there's no formula to get them to gain that insight. It is, it is a, a mental condition and can bring a lot of other illnesses with it as well. So for you, it sounds like a lot of acceptance from Alan on and seeing, accepting the way things are in this moment and the limitations, because unless someone has insight and can see their part and has motivation to change, they're not gonna change. I don't care what you do, they're not gonna change. And find your peace with that truth and be there when you can, but watch your expectations because your heart's going to break if you don't. Well said, Melody. Well said. You know, um, narcissists and borderline to have no empathy for others, no yep. empathy for their fellow man, for their parents, for their siblings. They're incapable of feeling empathy because they're so caught up in their abandonment issues and their <laughs> hypochondria and their. Uh, uh, high expectations of others and always feeling disappointed by others. So they have a rage attack and have to quit talking to another person and you don't talk to them for two or three years and then they come back and they're, they're just the same. There is treatment modalities today for them, mm -hmm. but they really have to commit to treatment. Treatment teams called dialectical behavioral therapy, a whole team approach to work with the borderline and the best place to treat borderlines in LA is the Clearview treatment. Clearview is the best. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it, it, without, if there are no more questions for Melody, I don't see any more. Well, Julian, you had your hand up here. I don't see you, Julian, but I see a hand. I, I yes. just had spoken actually to, to, oh, to both Julian, you guys. I remember but you from so long ago. We spoke long ago. No, no, you were terrific, Sharon. In fact, my mother, who visited that time, came to see you in a lecture at Royce Hall when you were temporarily located. And I remember after the lecture, because you got my hopes up a little bit before you met her, and I said to you, oh, my God, you, you, you said this and that. And how come you didn't tell my mother this and that? And you said, Julian, I gave your mother a few suggestions. She started making excuses for your sister, so there's nothing I could do at that point. I'll never forget that. But I have uh, something to add. If you and Melody, you guys are wonderful, but generally speaking, all over LA and all over the world, if the expert social workers and therapists do not want to work with a borderline or a narcissist or the fictitious person disorder, and you guys are supposed to be the Michael Jordan Gretzky's, then what hope is there for the layman families to cope with these things? Well, Sharon said it beautifully. Dialectical behavioral therapy seems to be the best. It was created by a brilliant lady called Marsha Linehan. And um, it's a brilliant way of uh, a borderline that has to hold on to their perception of the world, but at the same time, allowing that maybe they could say, a, a, a approach it differently. And that combination at least gets them to function better in the world. They'll, they'll, they're, they're, the real chances of change can improve with it. So always, you know, I, I, I don't specialize in eating disorders, but I specialize in, in traumas. So I would send somebody to an eating disorder. Make sure that if, you, if she goes to see them and you've got great social workers in Montreal, it's a wonderful medical system up there. Get a social worker who's trained in DBT. And, and then just another thing, Julian, you know, your mother is used to dealing with that. She's been dealing with it her whole life. Mm -hmm. So her expectations must be pretty low and she must have some tools, psychological tools to get through the daughter's rage attacks. Uh, she must have, you know, so uh, because you do develop those tools when you live with someone who has intermittent explosive disorder. Yeah, and Julian, I want to really ask you something. You're spending so much of your life energy and force on this, and you live, you know, 3,000 miles away. I want you just to ask that question of yourself. What would I be doing if I wasn't doing this? Because it sounds like so much of your life energy and force is around things that you have absolutely no control over in a place that's 3,000 miles away. 
So I ask you to be think about what is it that you need to bring you comfort and joy and pleasure. Sometimes it's a butterfly, sometimes it's music. But I want you to think about creating that space in your life to find out who you are and what brings you happiness in the world. Because they're getting, they're changing is not, cannot be connected to you being happy because they're not going to change. Thank you for that. Thank you. You know, we do have to bring this meeting to a close. Uh, unless Janice, did you want to say one yeah. last thing? I wanted to say one last thing. So my son has paranoid schizophrenia uh -huh. and he is currently at UCLA because he didn't take his meds one day, Saturday back there waited 23 hours to get a room, whatever. They're just like a country club. They're wonderful. They're, it's wonderful. But what I wanted to say to the mom whose daughter was the professor at, at USC, my son was at a program, he's 28 now, it's called Earth House in New Jersey. And it's like a farmhouse environment. But what I learned for two years, he was there, no sugar for, for schizophrenia and mental illness, no sugar, no dairy, no red meat, no caffeine. They literally, no coffee and no green tea. Get outside 23 hours a week, get fresh air, walk, exercise. But I found, because he gained 67 pounds initially on clozapine, the only med that works for paranoid schizophrenia. And I refused his doctor, don't let him go back on that because he's tall and thin. And Jim who runs Earth has promised me he won't gain it. Literally, it, he did not gain a pound. It's been several years. He's tall and thin. And the diet is so important. And a lot of people mm -hmm. don't emphasize that. So that's all I had to say. Thank you for that. Jennifer. Thank you. So, so dear Melody Anderson, we thank you for a very provocative talk and a lot of wise suggestions and answers that you gave to all the people that asked questions. And you read everybody perfectly the nuance of of what where the question was coming from inside of them so thank you so much i look forward to listening to your lecture and talk and and a relationship with our nami audience on our website and you will be there melody so you might want to check it out yourself thank you so much thank and you I, so much for the I'm, opportunity i'm happy i have referred clients to you in the past because i think they are getting the best treatment they can being referred you. to you Okay, thank you. I wanted to just say we're having another speakers meeting at uh, the first uh, Wednesday in April, a Janice Black Warner a speaker series, and Adam Shoulder, who has a treatment team, a treatment Absolutely. program, and uh, insight treatment for individuals. He's been very helpful with mentally ill uh, uh, clients that come through NAMI that he learns about through his support group. So we thought we'd have him speak because he's been so helpful with his treatment modality and residential treatment place here in LA with mentally ill people. So Adam Shoulder, who's also a social worker, will be speaking at the first Wednesday in April. So thank you for attending tonight. Thank you for caring about your relative. Thank you for having the courage to come be with us. And we look forward to seeing all of you again. And Nazi, it's so nice to see you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thank you.